So as you know, Tom Hartman is a progressive national, national and internationally syndicated talk show host. He's a New York Times best-selling author of 24 books, 17 of which have been published in other languages. And uh, yeah, Tom's latest book, which is available for purchase downstairs in the lobby, um, and can be signed by him at the end of the night, is titled The Hidden History of the War on Voting, Who Stole Your Vote, and How to Get It Back. <laughs> it's the third in a series of books. He says he's going to do 10 of them. The first three were on Guns, the, well, this is the third, so the first two were on guns and Supreme Court. Coming up next, he says, is a book on monopoly and the destruction of the middle class. So lots to look forward to. Um, but we're here tonight. We all know this is a critical election year, and Tom shines much needed light on what's go what goes into the voting process in our country. The beauty of it as well as the parts that are grimy, that are dirty, and despicable. I'm grateful that Tom Hartman engages us in conversation about uh, these really serious topics every day and invites us to be well-informed as we get in conversations in our daily lives about these topics. And with this, I'd like you to join me in and uh, 913 KBCS Seattle Town Hall in welcoming Tom Hartman. Hello, Seattle. Oh, that one works. <laughs> okay. Whoa. Hang on just a second here. Let me. All right. This is a two handed job here. There we go. All right. So glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. It is great to see you all. And um, I'm just I'm going to do a little short riff here about, uh, you know, one of the uh, many subjects of the book, one of the things that I talk about in the book, and um, then I'm going to invite uh, Representative Jayapal out here, and we're going to basically have a conversation for an hour or so about the state of politics and what's up and what we're doing and, and how things are going and the state of the, of the Democratic Party and all, you know, just we'll see where it goes. Uh, but there's all kinds of potential stuff. But the, the main story I wanted to share with you is, um, you know, the, the Republican Party ever since, um, you know, the Buckley decision in 76 and the Bellotti decision in 78 that um, made it legal. This, these, the Supreme Court made it, which is my last book, The Hidden History of the Supreme Court and the Betrayal of America, how the Supreme Court made it legal for billionaires and corporations to own their very own private politicians, right? They're, they're, or their very own public politicians. Um, when that happened, the, the Republican Party was in absolute shambles. It was just a disaster. This was right after Reagan, excuse me, right after Nixon, um, after the Nixon scandal and the Nixon resignation, and then in 76 when Jerry Ford lost to a peanut farmer from Georgia that nobody had ever heard of, the Republican Party was like, oh my God, you know, we'll never survive this, right? That was, people were writing books about the end of the, of the GOP. And so when the Supreme Court gave them this gift of, you know, well, you can take unlimited money now, um, they said, okay, cool, we'll be the party. Now, the Democratic Party at that point in time was very much the party of labor, but the Republicans said, okay, we'll be the party of, of big money, and we'll, we'll take oil's money, and we'll take tobacco's money, and we'll take anybody's money. And, uh, but, but they couldn't quite say that to the voters, so they had to come up with new ideas, you know, things like trickle-down economics and, and whatnot. But in any case, they, they uh, throughout the 80s and even into the 90s, 
Uh, well, actually, going all the way back to the 60s, the Republicans had been practicing voter suppression. William Rehnquist, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, got his start in Arizona, standing, uh, going into voting places, polling places in Hispanic and Native American neighborhoods, and he was a big bear of a guy, 6'2", 200 pounds, and he would just, oh, you don't look like you, you're, you're, you're on the road, you know, you're out of the road, are you? And he'd just literally scare people away. And, uh, you know, that endeared him, of course, to the Republican Party. Um, and then they came up with this thing in the early 70s of sending postcards, in, you know, not from government agencies, but from the party itself, although it never said Republican Party on it. It would say, you know, Citizens for Good Government or whatever. They had all these funny organizations. But they'd send these postcards into mostly minority communities that said, do you still live at this address? And if the postcard wasn't returned, uh, then they would challenge that person's right to vote. They'd literally have somebody at the polling place with a long list of names that weren't returned that they knew were, were supposed to vote at that polling place, and they'd challenge every single one of them. And, and you know, many of those people were denied the right to vote. Well, the, the Democrats sued, and for 20 years, the Republicans operated under a restraining order preventing them from doing, that was called caging back then, um, uh, preventing them from, from caging. Now, of course, the Supreme Court just legalized this last year in a decision, uh, you know, Husted v. somebody or other, the, you know, maybe it was the year before last, uh, when Ohio was doing this, and, and they said, well, if it's a state agency, that's just fine. I guess you, political parties can't do it. So now it's uh, secretaries of state. But in any case, just to, t to give you this narrative on this story, by 2000, the new ideas BS that, the, that uh, Reagan and the Republicans and, and all their think tanks, you know, the ones funded by the Coors and the Scafes and the, and, the, and the Cokes and whatnot, was wearing off. And, you know, people were seeing that, you know, the, these giant tax cuts and all these breaks and deregulation and taking apart the EPA and all this stuff, it really wasn't producing the results that were promised. It wasn't producing prosperity. And, and the Republicans were in trouble again. And in 2000, they put up their candidate, George W. Bush, for president. And his, he was the governor of, uh, of Texas, and his brother was the governor of Florida. And the early polling looked like the decision, the, the election was probably going to be decided on, based on Florida. That was probably going to be the state that was going to turn this thing. And so George Bush's Texas provided a list of felons in Texas to Jeb Bush's Florida. And what Catherine Harris, the Secretary of State in Florida, did was said, you know, let's compare this, let's compare these two lists. We don't need to match middle names, it's not that big a deal. And, um, and let's compare these lists and see how many of these felons from Texas have moved to Florida and registered to vote, because here in Florida it's illegal to vote if you're a felon. And uh, sure enough, there were about 90,000 of them. Uh, of, of people who had the same names. Well, the reason why, and, and, and the majority, the vast majority of them were minorities, and the reason why is because um, while there's huge name diversity in the Caucasian population, because white people come from everything from Scandinavia to Greece to, to Russia to, you know, it's just all, all these different languages, and so there's all these different last names. Whereas among Hispanics, all the last names are derived from one single language, Spanish. And among African Americans, most, many, probably most of the names were either derived from Anglo-Saxon names, English names, that is the people who owned the plantations, um, or, they were, or they were named after presidents. 80% of all the people in the United States who are named Washington, for example, are black. So if you take a list that is largely people of color, which is the Texas felon list, and you compare it with the entire Florida voter list, where you're gonna have overla overlapping hits is among the Florida people of color, and which is exactly what they wanted to do. It's exactly what they did do. And that got George W. Bush within 500 and some odd votes of stealing the election with little help from the Supreme Court, of course. And that's a whole other story that we need not go into at this point. But there was this enormous blowback. Um, Greg Pallast and the BBC, a couple months after the election, found out about this. Um, exposed it to the world. That BBC report, it still lives on the internet. It's mind-boggling. It never played in the United States, but it played everywhere else. But the word spread, 
ACLU and the NAACP, they sued, uh, you know, Jeb and George and the whole bunch of them. And if you remember 2000, early 2001, uh, there was all this talk about George W. Bush was an illegitimate president. And he was very, his popularity was in the tank and he was looking at all kinds of troubles. And the only thing that bailed him out basically was 9-11. So at that point now, you know, George W. Bush is back up in the polls, 9-11, but after 9-11, but the question was, how do we continue purging people off the voting rolls, like we did with the Texas felon list, in ways that nobody will find out about? So we don't end up with, you know, 100,000 people in the streets like they had in Miami-Dade County, you know, protesting the, the purge. How do we do it in a way that people can actually show up at the polls and think that they're voting, but we can make sure their vote never gets counted? There's got to be a way to do this. And so in 2002, they invented a, with a piece of legislation called the Help America Vote Act, uh, the Republican Party invented a new kind of ballot and it's called a provisional ballot. Now, the, the, uh, the bottom line basically is that if you are not registered where you're voting, if you're not supposed to be in that place, for example, if your precinct is 10 blocks over, you're in the wrong police precinct, um, then you can be given a provisional ballot. And in California, for example, you know, there were several million provisional ballots in the last election, but most of them got counted because they were people who were on the voting rolls for the states, they just were in the wrong place when they voted. But the, the cool thing about this from the Republican point of view is the, the person who decides whether or not provisional ballots are opened and counted or not is the Secretary of State of the individual states. So if you can knock somebody off the voting rolls like Jeb Bush did in Florida, people will show up and vote they think their name is on the roll. The clerk checks them in and says, well, I don't see your name here, but here's a provisional ballot. And they vote the provisional ballot and, you know, and think that they voted. Nobody's protesting. Nobody even understands what this means. And when they walk out of the polling place, there's somebody out there doing exit polls and the exit pollster says, well, who'd you vote for? Oh, I voted for Hillary Clinton. Great. And they, you know, the exit pollster writes it down and keeps track of that. So in 2004, the exit polls, for example, showed that John Kerry won Ohio by, you know, well over 100,000 votes. Now there were 186,000 provisional ballots in Ohio in 2004 that literally were never opened. John Edwards, his vice presidential candidate, was on my show, um, you know, right after the election, just rip-roaring angry because John Kerry was not, because the, there were more provisional votes than the votes by which John Kerry officially lost. But he didn't, you know, you had, in Ohio, the Secretary of State said, the only, the only way you're going to get us to open those ballots is if you sue us. And John Kerry was not willing to do that. And that's the, that's the way it works in all the red states right now. So we started seeing this funny thing called redshift, which is where the exit polls showed that uh, the Democrat had won, but the official results had shifted to the red, to the Republican Party, and the official results showed that the Republican had won. And it was weirdly only happening in states with Republican secretaries of state after 2002, in a large, in large part. A lot of us back then, and I, I wrote a lot of articles about this in, 2000, in the period from 2003 until you know, probably around 2010, um, a lot of us assumed that it had to do with the voting machines, because the other thing the Help America Vote Act did is it gave $5.6 billion to the states to buy voting machines from, from uh, Diebold and ESNS, two companies that were started by these two brothers who were end-time millennial Christians who wanted there to be a war in Israel to end all wars and all this kind of, and so, you know, it was kind of, kind of sketchy stuff. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, we thought it was probably the voting machines. We, this, this whole thing of provisional ballots just kind of flew under everybody's radar. And, it, and this redshift produced some really significant changes in election outcomes. In fact, just in 2016, this is from page 92 of my book. If you have a copy of the book, you can read along. For example, in the 2016 election, the exit poll showed Hillary Clinton carried Florida 
by 47.7% to Trump's 46.4%. Although the actual counted vote had Trump winning by 49 to 47.8%. Trump gained two and a half percentage points somehow. In North Carolina, exit polls showed Clinton winning 486 to 46.5%, but the votes that were counted turned out with Trump 49 to Clinton's 46, a red shift of 5.9 percentage points. Now, just to, just to put a codicil on this, we started doing exit polls in the United States back in the 1950s and 1960s. They had fine-tuned it to a science by the 1970s. A guy named Warren Matofsky, who was a statistician, really, really developed this to the point where in the 1980s, our news networks were actually calling elections based on exit polls. And you'll recall in, in the 2000 election, you know, the, the, there were news organizations that were calling it for, for Al Gore based on the exit polls in Florida that showed Al Gore had 90,000 more votes than, than George W. Bush. Little did they know, right? Um, and in the 2004 election, it was briefly called for John Kerry based on exit polls. Well, as this red shift started, and, and, and by the way, it wasn't just the United States. I lived in Germany, and in Germany, um, all the ballots are done on paper. It, it takes three days to count the ballot. In fact, it's like jury duty. You get a letter in the mail that says you will show up and count votes and your employer has to give you three days off work to be a, a vote counter. And everybody does that, you know, uh, maybe once every 10, 20 years, something like that. Um, they do that all over Europe. Everybody votes on paper. Well, we just saw this with Boris Johnson in the UK where, where you know, the, the exit polls called the election the night of the election, but it took a full four days for them to count all the ballots in the UK. That's normal. Election, and the exit polls are never off. They're never off by more than a half a point. Um, in 2004, in the election in Ukraine, the, the exit polls showed that the guy who was supported by the West won, but the official tally showed that the guy who was supported by Russia won. And when those exit polls were released and widely publicized, people came out in the streets, a million people. Remember the Orange Revolution? They took down a government because the exit polls were off, or the actual vote tally was off. The exit polls were accurate, as they found when they redid the election. So anyhow, back to, back to 2016. I gave you uh, uh, Florida, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. The exit polls showed that Clinton won by 50.5% to Trump's 46%. But when the eligible Pennsylvania voters were counted, Trump carried the state 48.8 to Clinton's 47.6 a red shift of 5.6 percentage points. Now, the United Nations uses exit polls to certify the validity and, and honesty of elections across the Middle East, across Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South America. And, you know, a 5.7% shift off an exit poll is clear evidence of fraud, according to the United Nations, or the Carter Center, which also does this. And in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, Clinton beat Trump in the exit polls 48.2 to 44.3 percent, although the real count put Trump over the top at 48.8 percent to 47.6 percent, a red shift of 5.1 percentage points. So the bottom line here, and just to kind of summarize this very quickly, and, and then I want to invite Representative Jayapal out here, is that the new go-to strategy that the Republican Party has put together using the, 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 the boogeyman, the canard of voter uh, fraud, that there's all these Mexicans coming into America who are illegals and they're voting and they're going out in buses and things. And, you know, you'll recall George W. Bush demanded in his first term that, his, uh, that the entire Justice Department, all 100 federal prosecutors, make their top priority finding these Hispanic voters who were illegals who were voting. Illegals, his phrase, right? We call them undocumented workers. Um, and they spent millions of dollars, something like $70 million. They spent almost two years. Eight of his prosecutors, federal prosecutors, resigned over this because they said, this is crazy. You're not going to find this. And we've got to, you know, we're supposed to be tracking down counterfeiters and rapists and, you know, killers and stuff. Um, and he replaced them, and sure enough, they did it, and they looked at 840 million ballots, and the number of people over a 10-year period, and the number of people that they found who had voted who were not legal citizens, were not legally entitled to vote, was 35 
About half of them were Europeans here on green cards who thought the green card entitled them to vote. Most of them voted for Republican candidates. <laughs> and the other half of them were people who had felony arrests on their record, who lived in states where felons aren't allowed to vote, and they didn't realize it. The total number of Hispanic people who they found had voted in that 10-year period out of that 840 million votes was zero. And yet still, state after state after state, right now, all across the United States, are passing these voter ID laws. We used to have actually a biometric system to register to vote. You know, you, you would check the signature of the person. It's harder to forge a signature when you're doing it live in front of a person. Because when you first registered, you, you would sign a card, and then when you come to vote, they'd compare the, your signature to the card. It's harder to forge a signature than it is to forge an ID. But, you know, hey, we got to throw that out. We got to go to ID. Why? Well, because, you know, people, poor people don't have IDs. They don't have driver's licenses. People who live in big cities don't have driver's licenses. Older people who don't drive anymore don't have driver's licenses. And students very often don't have driver's licenses. And those are all Democratic voters. So the point is that the go-to strategy now, the only, the, literally the only reason why George Bush and Donald Trump became president, the only reason why six or seven of the Republican senators in the United States Senate are sitting there, the only reason why those two people became president, and the only reason why about 50 members members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Republican members are, are in office right now, is voter suppression of this type. And so the message that I want you to carry out, you don't have to worry about this here in Washington State, you've got a Democratic Secretary of State. They're not doing voter purges here. Oh, is a Republican? Oh my God, I didn't realize that. I'm sorry. I just came from California. They're, well, okay, keep an eye on that, on that person. Wow. Okay, I didn't know. Um, but in any case, the, the main message, I mean, you're in a state that generally has pretty good election integrity, but the bottom line is the, what I want all of America to know, and I want you to tell all your friends, tell everybody you know on Facebook and whatever social media you have and, you know, Thanksgiving dinner and whatever, is if you live in one of these red states or one of these states with the Republican Secretary of State, Check your voter registration. Check it repeatedly. Make sure that you're registered to vote. And if you show up and somebody tries to give you a provisional ballot, raise hell. Get a bullhorn and come back and stand in front of that polling place. <laughs> Call the media. Write letters to the editor. Absolutely raise hell, because this is the only way that these guys are holding on to power right now. So anyhow, that's, that's my riff. Um, with that, let me... Uh, introduce my, my guest and our guest. Uh, prior to serving in elected office, Representative Jayapal spent 20 years working in international and domestic public health and development. She founded and was the executive director of One America, the largest immigration advocacy organization in Washington state and one of the largest in the country. Today, Congresswoman Jayapal is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, where she serves as the Vice Chair of the Immigration Subcommittee and on the House Education, Labor, and Budget Committees. And she is also, this is my favorite part of her CV, she is also the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Please welcome Pramila Jayapal. So here's a microphone that I know works. Fantastic. We'll see if, ah, that, this one works now too. Cool. Okay, and I've got some questions here, but let's just talk. Um, I'd like to start out with, you heard my riff. Yeah, I did, yes, and it was fabulous, wasn't it? What? Aren't we excited to have Tom Hartman in Seattle? <laughs> what can we do about this? Well, look, I think that, um, it is really clear that everything that you lay out in the book and everything you laid out in your riff about the way in which Republicans have been fierce about trying to stop people from voting in every possible way possible um, across the country, that's what we have to fight. And in Washington State, I was telling Tom earlier backstage that I'm so proud to have written the automatic voter registration bill when I was in the state Senate. It passed last year. And one of the things that um, people may not remember is that we are one of only three states that allows 
anybody to get a driver's license regardless of citizenship. Um, it makes, yes, isn't that fabulous? It makes it a little bit more complicated when you try to do automatic voter registration just based on driver's licenses. So what we did is we actually added in not only uh, a driver's license, motor voter type registration, if you can also show citizenship at that time, but we also made it so that if you are in the public benefits plans, that you also can register to vote there. And because you, it requires citizenship for all of those plans. So it, you don't have to show papers in order to get registered, but if you go to sign up for the ACA or for other things through the state, you can get registered there as well. So we have a much more expansive automatic voter registration here in the state. In Congress, we um, have been working on this on multiple fronts, and it's exactly the prescriptions you outline in your book. Um, you know, fighting for the People Act, uh, the first bill that we passed in Congress to take on lobbying and corporate interference in our elections and to actually put um, uh, restrictions on um, what the president and the vice president and any members of the presidential family, even if they're not employed by the administration, what they have to disclose around transparency. Um, I have a great bill with Senator Warren that is an anti-corruption bill. We passed the Voting Rights Expansion Act on the floor to not just restore the Voting Rights, but also Voting Rights Act, but also to expand it. So, Tom, you've got, um, you know, I think everything you say in here is right, and it is a, uh, it has been a clear roadmap for Republicans, and I don't think that Democrats, frankly, have spent quite as much time thinking about how we ensure that we expand the, the, the electorate and make sure that we stop voter suppression, but we are on it now, and uh, we intend to do everything we can in this election to get the biggest possible turnout um, and energize people to care about our democracy. It's absolutely, it's absolutely what we have to do. Um, I, there's a, can we talk about the Democratic Party? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, um, I remember LBJ, you know, actually I got arrested protesting LBJ, but I was against his war, um, but I thought his public policies were great. I mean, you know, his, his, he, he took a lot of crap for the war, which was unfortunate. Well, I mean, it was deserved, I think, but nonetheless. Um, he brought us Medicare, he brought us Medicaid, he expanded uh, unemployment insurance, he brought us, you know, food stamps, he brought us SNAP, he brought us, I mean, just... The, the Great Society programs over a 10-year period cut poverty in half in the United States. And the values that he reflected were uh, merely an extension of the values that Franklin Roosevelt proposed uh, or, or lived and put into place. And you know, a year before he died, FDR did his second Bill of Rights where he said that education should be a right, which means you get it for free. No one can take it away from you. That healthcare should be a right you get it for free, no one can take it away from you. Housing should be a right, and a job should be a right that pays well. I mean, this is, this is, that's actually, those four things are actually more than I'm hearing than any of the Democrats are proposing tonight in the debates. I mean, this is serious, solid stuff. And so, um, if, you, if you look at the values of the Democratic Party from 1932 up until really 1992, most of the Democrats, the outliers, were the people who were saying, well, we can't quite do that stuff. You know, it, this was the core of the Democratic Party. But Reagan, the reason why the Democrats didn't sell out, out in, in um, 1980, you know, after the Buckley and, and, and um, uh, Bellotti decisions, was because they didn't need to. They had unions behind them, and the unions were just floating in money. It's why corruption problems were happening in the unions, you know, the whole Jimmy Hoffa thing. But there was a lot of money and it was going to the Democratic Party. But Reagan went after the Democrats and nearly cut private sector union membership in half in 12 years. And so in 92, Bill Clinton was faced with this horrible decision. You know, we can't rely on the unions anymore. Um, we didn't have the internet to raise money. How do you launch a national campaign? And the decision was made, and Al Fromm wrote a book about this, you know, and Al Fromm was his colleague in starting the DLC. Um, we decided that we would not take money from the dirty industries. We're not going to take money from tobacco or oil or coal. 
but we will take money from the clean industries and the industries of the future, like health insurance and banking and, um, you know. <laughs> so, so the Democratic Party kind of swung in this direction and adopted these things and has kind of stayed there. It stayed there largely through the presidencies of both Clinton and Obama. And now there's this movement to take the Democratic Party back to its roots, now that there is a new funding source, that being the internet. Right? And you're one of the real leaders of that. As the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, you know, God bless you. You guys are the ones who are doing it. And, and I, I, it seems like we're almost at least halfway there. And, I, and, and, I'm, and I'm just wondering, A, do you agree with my diagnosis? And I, I, I don't see you know, Clinton or even Obama, and I think Obama was trying to move us farther away from this. He, he was protesting Citizens United. You know, Alito talked back to him. Um, and, 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 and I see them as, you know, generally good presidents and good people who were trying to do the very best with what they had, but um, how do we, you know, I tell people, go out and join your local Democratic Party, take over, become a precinct committee person, you know, help write the platform, choose the, the primary candidates, et cetera. But, you know, can you speak to that whole thing? I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. <laughs> there was a lot in there. Okay, first thing is, why do we need money to, why do we have to raise money to run in elections? We should have a publicly financed election system. No money, right? Secondly, I take no corporate PAC money. I think I was one of the early members of Congress not to take corporate PAC money. And Bernie Sanders did make it possible, I think, and Barack Obama uh, before that in a slightly different way, but they both made it possible for people to start to feel like, okay, if we don't want to take money from outside interests, how about everybody being able to give a little bit? Here in Seattle, we have the democracy vouchers, and in HR1, I was able to get an amendment to put that program in to a federal bill and try to do that in other places across the country. So in Seattle, we have publicly financed elections now um, through these democracy vouchers. But I think that that's a big piece of what is wrong with our system is, you know, you need a lot of money to run these campaigns. And I think um, in my election for Congress, it was a seven and a half million dollar race when I first ran. And um, we were funded by 125,000 donors who gave us $23 each. And I joked with Bernie that I beat his 27 back then. <laughs> but <laughs> he's beat me now by a lot. But, um, but I think that that method of running elections is so important, not just because it's a different way of funding a campaign, but also because it gives each of us agency, right? We are able to support candidates that we like through these democracy vouchers, and whether you're rich or poor, you get the same amount of money to support a candidate. Um, but there are a lot of other problems with how elections are run. I think that um, now, when you think about the idea of being a progressive, and I'm proud to be the co-chair of the Progressive Caucus with my really good friend Mark Pocan from Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> and we have about 100 members now, so it's about 40% of the Democratic Caucus. Um, but when, and, and we're trying to expand that, you know, we're doing a lot of work to build the infrastructure on the outside, to build the infrastructure on the inside, and then to build a pack that can really push and help elect progressives across the country. But when you think about what is a progressive, people are like, well, you know, I'm a progressive, I'm a progressive, what is a progressive? And I always say a progressive is just the first person to the best and most just idea. That's what progressives are. We fight for things before they're popular. We fight for things that people call us radical for, at least in today's day and age. Um, and these aren't radical ideas. I mean, the idea that everybody would have universal health care in the richest country in the world is not a radical idea. <laughs> Do you remember when Seattle became the first major city to pass a $15 minimum wage? I was on that committee and I sat through all these hearings about how this was a terrible idea and the economy would crash and businesses would not survive and restaurants would go under and guess what? 
We have the lowest unemployment in the country. We have the highest wages in the country, one of the highest wages in the country. We have restaurants, the same restaurants that came and testified to us before, have opened more and more restaurants across Seattle. We have a thriving, booming economy where people actually get to have a decent life. That's not a radical idea. And now in Congress, we just passed under a Democratic majority a $15 minimum wage. Across the De Democratic Party, every single Democrat voted for the $15 minimum wage. Not so radical, right? Um, and yet, you know, I think that this is the challenge we have is we have forgotten what we deserve. I, I've worked in civil rights and immigrant rights my whole career and for 30 years before becoming a Congress member and I've always thought about things from the perspective of human rights, which, I, which they are. I think these things are human rights. The, the right to liberty, um, you know, the, the right to uh, be able to actually get up in the morning and know you can buy your insulin or get your cancer treatment without having to decide whether you're going to pay your mortgage or do that. Um, these things allow us to be human beings. And so they are rights, but I really think that we have to get back to a place where we think about what we deserve. And we allow ourselves to believe that we deserve so much more than we are getting today. We allow ourselves to believe that the United States does not suffer from scarcity, we suffer from greed. And, you know, when people say, oh, you're pulling us too far to the left, um, it really frustrates me because every peer country in the world has these things. I sit on the, the Education and Labor Committee, and we had a panel of people from Europe testifying before us. And I said, okay, let's go down the line. You tell me how much you pay, a student pays, for higher education in your country. And the answers were like $395 a year total, right? $750 a year total. That includes books. That includes fees, tuition. This is for a higher education. You know what we do here in this country? We have $1.6 trillion in student loan debt, more than credit card debt in the country. And so when you think about what that does to the economy, it drags down the economy for sure, because how many people have kids living with them because they can't possibly afford to go live somewhere else, right? That happens. Grandparents who are paying the tuition, the, the debt of their grandkids. So it drags down the economy because people can't buy homes and can't buy cars and can't start families, but it also strips your soul it strips your soul. These young people are doing everything we ask them to do. They're going to get a higher education and they're coming out with mountains of debt and they can never pay that back. So these things are about what we deserve. And we need to be thinking bigger and bolder, not to be told that we're impractical or idealistic or that we want too much, or that if we just nibble around the edges, somehow things are gonna get better. They won't because the whole system is built for those who have money and have, want more money. It's not built for the working folks who actually just wanna have a decent life. So we need deep structural change. And I really... I don't know, Tom, I just, I, I listen to your show and I know you are talking about this all the time. I don't think, we have to beat Donald Trump in November. We absolutely have to beat Donald Trump in November. But, but let me tell you something, if we do not have a Democratic president that is bold enough and strong enough to take on the fossil fuel industry and the private insurance companies and the big pharma and all of those industries that are out there trying to keep the status quo, we will end up in the same place in the next four years with another kind of Donald Trump. Because Trump is both a symptom and a cause. He is both a symptom and a cause. He's horrible, he's racist, he's xenophobic, he's a liar. How many more things can we say about him? He needs to go. But he only, but he only got there 
because there was such deep inequality in our system. We've gone so far away from actually giving people the kind of opportunity that I got when I came to the United States at 16 years old with nothing in my pocket by myself as an immigrant, and now I get to be in the United States Congress thanks to you beautiful people who put me there. That's great. That, that, I, ha I have to tell you just a very brief story, apropos of your testimony from Europeans. Um, we were invited to do our show from Denmark, uh, Danish radio. It's like the NPR for Denmark. It's state-owned. And um, they gave us a studio for two weeks. Louise and I went over and we broadcast from Copenhagen every day, did our show live from there. And I have conservatives on my show all the time. I, 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 frankly, I very rarely have liberal guests on because I, I can do a pretty good job of just describing things. But, but I like to model for people how to debate with conservatives because we all have them in our lives, you know. And how do you, how do you have these fights without having blood on the floor, you know, when you're done? <laughs> so I wanted to do the same thing when I was in Denmark, and I asked the, and they gave me a producer. Uh, Danish Radio gave me a producer. And, and, um, and she said, who do you want to have as guests? And I said, I want to have your conservatives on. You know? And so she got the member of parliament who was the leader of the conservative faction in the parliament. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name any longer. But um, in fact, she got me. I mean, we, had, we were there two weeks. We had probably 20 different conservatives on. We had the publisher of the newspaper that did the cartoons, the Mohammed cartoons, who was conservative. It was a conservative newspaper. I had him on. Um, and, and I had the same conversation with virtually every one of them, but the leader of the conservative movement, it was the most, <laughs> it was the funniest. I, I, I was like, okay, so, so you're a conservative, a Danish conservative. And he was like, absolutely, I definitely am. And I said, so, so you must think that this whole Danish healthcare system where everybody gets free medicine and free drugs and free surgery and, and you know, even you know, free ambulance rides, you must think that's crazy, you know, that, that's wrong, that needs to be replaced. And he pauses for a minute and he says, what, you think I'm crazy? <laughs> and I said, well, y y y I thought you were a conservative. And he was like, I am. And I said, well, is it, you don't like the national education system where you can go to college all the way to a PhD and they give you a $400 a month subsidy for housing and, and free books and, and college is free? I mean, you want to do away with that, right? And he's like, no, that would ruin the country. And, and we went through like three or four of these things, and finally I said, then what makes you a conservative? And he said, I don't want any more immigrants in my country. That was it, right? That was it. But uh, the fact of the matter is that Europeans look at us and think, these people are nuts. <laughs> you know? and, we, and we are. Did you watch the... <laughs> there you go. Did you watch John Oliver had a 20-minute segment on Medicare for All? I saw it. And it was so fabulous. And, you know, and they give a prize in England to, or was it Canada? It was Canada, actually. I think they give a prize to, you know, the most amazing, patriotic. Beloved. Beloved. And it was the health care system. Yeah, it was Tommy Douglas, uh, yes. Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland's grandfather. Correct. Who, was, who founded the national health care system in Saskatchewan. Right, and they're, and they're jumping on trampolines to promote the, the British health care system. So, I mean, I just, I think that, you know, when people say, oh, we can't possibly afford to, um, to do Medicare for all, my answer is we can't possibly afford not to. We, we can't. We just can't. Um, you, you, you mentioned uh, if we don't have a candidate who energizes the Democratic Party base, then we may not defeat Donald Trump in this election. And I, I'm of the opinion that if, we, that if Donald Trump is reelected, he, you think he was unchained after he didn't get impeached or didn't we, get removed from office. He got impeached. Yeah, we did, impeached yeah. him in the House of Representatives. <laughs> Amen. Forever impeached. Point taken. But you know what I mean. I mean, he's now he he's... He get removed because now, yeah. of the lack of courage of the Republican yes. senators, except yes. for Mitt Romney, and everything that happens after this is on their heads. Yes. Amen. And hopefully it'll become, uh, you know, campaign issues and everything else. But I'd like, I'd like you to expand on that. I, you know, I riff about this on the radio a lot, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear you um, take this on, this idea that 
Um, uh, you know, uh, this, I don't know if it was this morning or yesterday morning, uh, I was talking to my wife and she had caught Stephanie Rule's show. And Stephanie constantly has these people on from the right wing think tanks and, and, they, were, and they were talking about how if Bernie Sanders is, elect the, is the nominee of the party, it's gonna guarantee that the Democratic Party is gonna go down in flames. I saw one on CNN where the guy was saying he'll be George McGovern just like 1972. Of course, McGovern had all kinds of problems. Tom Eagleton had shock therapy. His, his, his you know, his, I, I don't need to recite it all. I mean, this is not 1972 and Bernie Sanders is not uh, George McGovern. Um, but I, I literally, you can't listen to MSNBC or CNN. And of course, on MSNBC, a lot of the hosts are actually Republicans, you know. Um, but, um, and, and CNN, they're less partisan. But um, you can't watch either of those networks for more than an hour or two, uh, or at least I haven't been able to over the last few weeks, without hearing this story that if, if Bernie or Elizabeth Warren and, and uh, you know, I haven't endorsed one or the other, but I have endorsed both of them. I think, you know, either one is fine with me. Um, it's obviously looking like Bernie has most of the momentum, but, you know, it, there's still an election and people need to decide. But, but they're, they're making this assertion that the only way the Democratic Party can win is by going to the center. And in my, I'm, I mean, Republicans have been running base elections since 1964. It, it didn't work in 64, but it did work for them in 1980. It did work for them in 2000. It did work for them in 2016. It works for them in the Senate. It works for them in red states. Um, Democrats haven't run a base election since Lyndon Johnson ran for, for re-election in 64. And he wiped out Barry Goldwater by promising that he was going to give everybody Medicare. And, and uh, you know, so, so, Talk to us about base strategies. How do you win elections? How do Democrats win elections? Well, I, I was so struck in your book, you talk about you know, Donald Trump getting elected by 26% of registered voters. Elect, uh, eligible voters. Eligible voters, okay, eligible voters. Um, that figure is stunning to me, and it is part of the frustration I've had for a long time with the way politics has done, including with the Democratic Party. When I was an activist, um, doing immigrant rights work, I got frustrated because we couldn't get enough elected officials to listen to us. Um, and so I realized that what we needed was either money or votes. And we didn't have money, so it had to be votes. So I led the largest voter registration drive in the history of the state. We registered 23,000 new immigrant citizens to vote. And, <laughs> and what I realized as we were doing that is that nobody had been talking to the vast majority of voters or eligible voters for a very long time. It wasn't just eligible voters, it was also just voters. What was happening is we were spending more and more money on this shrinking base of voters that we called likely voters. Well, what is a likely voter? A likely voter, according to most consultants, political consultants, is somebody who has voted three out of the last four elections. Well, guess what? If you're a new voter, you haven't voted in four elections. If you move, you no longer count as somebody who's voted in the same place. So you don't count for those three out of four elections. And how about if you've just been frustrated for the last couple of elections and so you didn't vote, why should you be written off? And so this whole myth of the likely voter is something that we just have to move past. And actually, I do think we moved past it in 2018, thanks to the grassroots movement across the country that um, Indivisible, Move On, all these groups that said, okay, we are going to get the largest voter turnout possible, and we're not just going to focus on those likely voters. We're going to run field campaigns. Instead of just being on TV, we're actually going to knock on people's doors. We're going to talk to them. We're going to mobilize a voting base. We're not just going to assume that if you go on TV, which is very important, you do have to go on TV, but you can't just, bless you, you can't just focus on that, right? You have to have a field game. And so um, we did that in our congressional campaign. We knocked on 120,000 doors. We made over 240,000 phone calls. And it was one of the early campaigns at the congressional level that said, you know what, we're, we're, we're not going to focus on the traditional ways that campaigns have been run. We're going to go after people that haven't voted before, and we're going to give them a reason to want to believe in us again. That's what I noticed when I was knocking on people's doors, is they kept saying to me, why should I? 
Why should I vote? There's nobody there that inspires me. There's nobody there that's talking to me. There's nobody there that's fighting for me to have a home or have a decent job or you know, speaking in a way that inspires me to believe that government actually matters. And so I think that this is the thing that um, we have to do in this election. And I think we're incredibly fortunate to have two strong progressive candidates running for president, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And at the end of the day, I think the candidate that can inspire the largest, most broad, most diverse movement should be the one that wins. And I think um, that is why I've endorsed Bernie. I think most people know that that's why I've endorsed Bernie. Because when I go into Iowa, I campaigned for him for two weekends in Iowa and then in New Hampshire. I was just in California for him. We just had a rally with 17,000 people at the Tacoma Dome. Um, I'll, I'll, be in, I'll be in North Carolina and South Carolina for him on Monday and Tuesday. And what I just keep seeing, even in Iowa, in the most rural part of Iowa, we're in this little rural town, and this guy gives us his basement to, to do a, caucus, a campaign launch, a canvas launch, and we're crowded into his basement. There's 125 or 150 people in there. They are so diverse. I mean, folks of all ages, folks of all races, and people from all over the world. Like, there, there were people from Ireland and people from, you know, uh, different parts of, uh, of, of Europe, somebody who had come from Africa. And I said, why did you come all the way here? to campaign and they said, you have no idea, and actually they didn't know I was an immigrant, so I, I do have some idea, how important the United States role is on the global stage. We cannot continue to have endless wars. We cannot continue to have no diplomacy. We cannot continue to have the United States not take climate change seriously. You know, so, I mean, so I, I just feel like, Tom, this is the way we're going to win, not through murky moderation, but through progressive populism. That's what we need. Amen. And, and that, that, was, that was John Nichols' line, by the way, from The Nation. Oh, really? Murky moderation, progressive populism. I just feel like I have to acknowledge it wasn't my yeah. phrase. It was John, my friend John's. That's a great one, yeah. I, John is a good friend of mine, too. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. Um, yeah, spot on. Um, the Senate, I want to talk about the Senate a little bit. Um, in, in, after the Civil War, uh, uh, well actually, yeah, immediately after the Civil War, the southern states had been basically kicked out of the Union and they had to go back and rewrite, they called it reconstruct, their constitutions in order to exclude slavery and take out all the, all the other laws that were ancillary to that. Um, before they would be eligible to reapply back into the United States. And uh, Abraham Lincoln was looking at this and he, he knew the power of the Senate. And uh, at that point in time, in order for a territory to become a state, it had to have 128,000 citizens. But he needed two more senators because he could see it coming that you know pretty soon Georgia was going to finish their constitutional convention and pretty you know and, and this was coming and so he reached out to the Nevada Territory which had 7,000 citizens in it and said we're going to make an exception to the rule here and we're going to create a state we're going to give statehood to Nevada so that we'll have two senators because Nevada was never a slave state and it was reliably Republican and so he added a state specifically to for the, for the anti-slavery Republicans to hold control of the Senate. He gets assassinated, Andrew Johnson comes along, has a screwed up presidency, helps destroy Reconstruction, brings in the, these slave states even more rapidly than anybody anticipated. He leaves office after being impeached, um, but not being removed from office. Um, and, and Ulysses Jackson comes in as the next president or Grant, yeah, excuse me, U Ulysses Grant, I thank you. Bless you. I, it's Seattle. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I constantly say I've got the smartest listeners in the world. I, it's, it's just like I, I learn from my own listeners. Most independent bookstores per capita, too, right here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, which reminds me of something. Um, so, so Grant was looking at the same problem. It was starting to speed up again. And again, it took 128,000 citizens to make a state. Well, the entire Dakota Territory had 38,000 people in it. But Ulysses Grant says, well, we'll split that into two, and we'll make them both states, and we'll get four more Republican senators. And, and he did it. You know, he pulled it off. I mean, the Republicans controlled the House and the Senate at the time so that they could, they could pass it, and they did it to maintain their power. This was a naked power grab by Lincoln and by Grant. And you could argue for the best of intentions, but nonetheless, that's what it was. So here we have a situation now where, um, I'm trying to remember the exact number, maybe, maybe uh, probably you know it, um, the 25 smallest states have 50 senators and they represent what, 15% of the U.S. population yeah, or something like I think that? That's Some right. mind-boggling or, number? Yeah, mm -hmm. 16. 16% of the population? You guys don't know, you're just making it up. <laughs> So, so what do we do about that? I mean, I think, um, I think we have to get rid of the Electoral College. <laughs> we need to give DC statehood. We need to bring in Puerto Rico. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other electoral reforms, I think, that we could seriously take on. I personally believe we should get rid of the filibuster because there's very little that we can do, um, even if we have the majority, given where everything is. Now, I know there are different views on this, but I sometimes feel like, I don't really like war analogies or fighting analogies, but I sometimes feel like we take a butter knife to a giant battle, you know, and there's assault weapons arrayed against us, and we got our little butter knife there. And um, we, we could use nonviolent, peaceful protest and resistance and have everybody out in the streets for uh, what I think really needs to happen. I'm kind of surprised it didn't happen after Donald Trump wasn't removed, honestly. But um, in the absence of everyone getting into the streets, I think we're gonna need some bigger tools to be able to pass some of the reforms that we need to pass. We need to get money out of politics. We need, we need to do that. Um, I think I mentioned I've got a bill with Elizabeth Warren and you know, in that we actually say the judiciary also should be, the Supreme Court should be subjected to the same ethics rules as the rest of the judiciary. So, I don't know, are you suggesting we like break up California and well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a good idea, but I don't think California does. I, you know, I but, don't think but, so. But if California became three states, if Texas became two states, if Florida became two states, if New York City separated from New York State, yeah. then you would have a Senate that was actually representative of the exactly. United States. And but it's unlikely that any of those I think states that's are going to go for that. It's probably unlikely and probably really unpopular. But um, <laughs> At least in those states. In those it's states. real popular in Washington and Oregon, I can tell you. <laughs> well, wait till you talk about <laughs> splitting up Washington. It wouldn't be so popular, yeah. right? Um, but, but I do think that there are just some deep problems with how elections happen, how voting happens. I mean, I don't think that Iowa and, this is going to be unpopular too, but, you know, not in Washington maybe, but I don't think Iowa and Nebraska, sh uh, ne uh, New Hampshire, should be the first two states in the country. Like... At least for Democrats. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, if you want to have all white states, let the Republicans yeah, hold their have, primaries have there. That makes sense, or, right? Or have a variety. You know, like right. if you want to say, well, different states, okay, fine, then have some of those states, but also have like California or some of these other, have Nevada earlier. Um, because I think that there is momentum set in, I, I, when I was campaigning in Iowa, I said what happens in Iowa does not stay in Iowa. It goes on to New Hampshire and what happens in New Hampshire goes on to Nevada. It just is the way it is. Yeah, excellent point. Um, 
I, I, this is not in my book, and it's not in my book because I didn't know this until a few weeks ago when somebody called into my show and, and said, did you know that the 14th Amendment, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, says that if a state engages in voter suppression, they will lose members of Congress. And I was like, what the hell? I've never heard of that. Is that true? And, well, I'll read it to you. I mean, I just, I've got my little pocket constitution in my, in my phone here. And um, it's, you know, it, it says represent, I'm going to abbreviate parts of this, but representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature is denied to any of the inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age or older, or in any way abridged, except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in the state. So Brian Kemp knocked 580,000 people off the voting rolls in the two years before he ran against Stacey Abrams. That's two congressional districts in Georgia. Well, if, Has anybody talked about taking them on? So, it, sort of. Um, my first, second day in Congress, third day in Congress, you know, we certify the results of the Electoral College. And um, I was one of eight, along with Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, Jamie Raskin, Jim McGovern, a few others, who stood up and challenged the Electoral College certification. And based on this? Based, I mean, it, it was actually, I guess it was based on this. I didn't know the exact text, but we said because, and my state was Georgia, the, the state that I was challenging was Georgia. And um, it was because of voter suppression in Georgia, all the lines, people that weren't allowed to vote at the polls, and that was the basis on which we, um, we challenged it. Uh, Joe Biden was actually presiding at that time, and I had watched when this happened. The Black Caucus also challenged the votes um, back in, in uh, I guess it would have been 2000, right? Um, in 2000. And I had watched Al Gore presiding, and so I wanted to know what would happen, because I knew we would get cut off. You have to have a senator also affirm your challenge. And we couldn't find a senator to affirm the challenges. And so um, we knew we were going to get cut off. And uh, I was in, quite rudely cut off, actually, <laughs> by, by the by the vice president. And um, the entire Republican side stood up and, and gave him a standing ovation for, for cutting me off. And um, so later I was asked, my, my face turned, I mean, this is like my third day in Congress. <laughs> but I figured you elected me to be a fighter for people. And so that's what I was going to do. But a Washington Post reporter asked me about it, and I said it was so nice of the Republican side to give me a standing ovation on my third day. <laughs> but I, I now realize that that is what, um, that is that the, the basis, basis of, of that. It. Yeah. I did, see, now thank I you for teaching me that, I actually. Well, and, and thank you for teaching me that it's being used and people are paying yeah. attention to it, because you know, I thought I'd discovered some, you know, some little nook and cranny that nobody even knew about. Um, some, some folks here have uh, passed questions along to us. So let me just, uh, let's just grab some of these. Oh, we didn't pick up your card? Oh, oh well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, great. So the, uh, this question is, uh, you know, when did Bernie Sanders first appear on your show? I'll just, if I may tell a quick story, please. Um, oh, there's some more of these. Here. Okay. Well, All right, everybody. Here. Thank you. We'll All righty. Okay. This, is, this is, what we have now is going to well exceed the amount of time we have available, so... If you still have one, I'm sorry. We're okay. We're <laughs> we're maxed out here. All righty, thanks. Um, we'll do our best. So, uh, when did Bernie Sanders first appear on my show? I started the show in 2003, and uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, we're just okay. <sighs> we started the show in 2003, and. Um, 
in uh, early 2004, Bernie was doing a radio show on a station uh, in Vermont. I was in Vermont. Our show had been picked up by the IE America Radio Network, so I was on 28 stations around the country plus uh, uh, XM sat or Sirius Satellite Radio. And um, the guy who owned the station in Vermont, he said, you know, Bernie just, he's got a great show. Every, every Friday he'd come on and he'd take calls and, and answer questions for people. And people loved it in central Vermont, but he's running for re-election and so he had to suspend the show because of the election laws. But he could go on your show as a guest. And so I said, well, you know, I'm willing to consider it. I'd met Bernie three times at that. I mean, you live in Vermont, you can't not meet Bernie, right? You, 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 go, you go to the, you know, you go into town to shop and there's Bernie holding a, you know, holding a town hall. Um, you know, you go out to the farmer's market, there's Bernie having a town hall. It's like, you know. Um, and, and so, uh, but I didn't really know him, and so I asked uh, this fellow to set up a meeting between the two of us, and he organized this meeting where we were supposed to meet at this uh, restaurant, this just kind of, you know, red checker tablecloth restaurant in, in uh, Burlington. And uh, Louise and I got there and, uh, a little bit early and, and, and sat down, and we were waiting for Bernie. And um, uh, after a few minutes, you know, the, the door kind of bursts open, and, you know, Bernie and his guy, Huck Gutman was his name, who was kind of his chief of staff, um, comes running in and he's got this phone to his ear and he's yelling into the phone, you know, are you kidding? They did that? IBM? Are you kidding? <laughs> and I'll get over there shortly. I'll be there right away. Don't you worry. We're going to do something about this. <laughs> and I'm looking at him like, and, and he's, he hasn't even sat down or anything. I mean, he's walking toward our table. He says, you must be Hartman. And I'm like, yeah. And, and this waitress is walking by, and he reaches out. He doesn't physically grab her, but he, you know, he, he kind of you know, says, hey, you. And she looks at him, and he says, get me something with chicken. <laughs> now. <laughs> I mean, it was sweet. It wasn't, you know, it was kind of crotchety old man, but also, also sweet. And, and he wolfed down about a third of his meal as we were talking, and he says, well, you seem acceptable, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll come on your show. And that began Brunch with Bernie. And for the next 11 years, every single Friday, um, Bernie was on our show. So in answer to that question. And, and I'm very grateful to Bernie for that. People try to give me credit for Bernie. I give cre Bernie credit for me. Um, so uh, let's see. I had some of these questions uh, organized at one point. <laughs> All right, uh, Bernie's Medicare for All is excellent plan, however, I wish I heard more about how his plan will allow folks to keep their current doctors. This is something people miss, that, that you know, we're talking about a payment system, not a healthcare system. You wanna riff no, on No, yes, absolutely I want to. Um, this is my bill in the house. I'm Bernie's National Health Policy Chair, and I tell you, we are talking about an insurance program we're not taking over doctors and hospitals. And what Medicare for All would do is expand the current Medicare system so that it has more expansive coverage. It would cover dental, vision, long-term care, hearing, the things you actually need, right? It would repeal the Hyde Amendment so reproductive care would be covered. Um, And then it would say, and it would cover long-term care. Did I say that? Long-term care also. Okay, um, that's really important. And, and then what we do is we say, you have a guaranteed government insurance program. No co-pays, no private insurance premiums, and no deductibles, right? So the idea is we want you to see the doctor if you're sick. In fact, we'd prefer that you go to the doctor before you get sick, and that, will be, uh, you know, if you, if you need pharmaceutical drugs, we have a provision in there where we would actually negotiate the price of pharmaceutical drugs. If drug manufacturers don't want to negotiate the price of pharmaceutical drugs, then we would do compulsory generic licensing. We would actually force that competition into the marketplace. So we're not taking over the doctors and hospitals. That would stay the same. But what we would do is, is actually provide the insurance program. Why is that so important? People say, well, why, why do you want to get rid of choice? Why don't you give Americans a choice by letting them keep their private insurance plan? Okay, first of all, 
People do not like their insurance plans. <laughs> Nobody likes their insurance plan. What they like is their doctor or hospital. And they think that their doctor or hospital is tied to their insurance plan because guess what? It kind of is right now. When people talk about choice, I say, okay, let's talk about choice. Let's say you've got an employer plan. Let's say you're one of the lucky people that has an employer plan. What choice do you have about your plan? Do you get to choose your plan? No, your employer chooses that. How about the doctors and hospitals? Nope, your insurance company determines what doctors and hospitals you get to see on that plan. Remember surprise billing? That's because a whole bunch of doctors and hospitals aren't covered and you don't find out until you've already had the urgent uh, operation that you needed to have. Do you have a choice about what services are covered? Nope. Your insurance plan decides that too, so much so that now they are putting their own doctor in at the insurance company to decide whether or not your doctor has made the right diagnosis about you, even though their doctor has never seen you before, doesn't know anything about you. Um, and how about if you get sick and you can't go to work anymore? You have choice now? There's no choice. You lose your job, you've got no choice. So the idea that these plans are somehow providing Americans with choice is ludicrous. And um, it, <laughs> you cannot have a, uh, there, there was just a really great study done by Yale um, that showed that Medicare for all who want it will cost about $600 billion more than Medicare for all. Why is that? Because if you have, now I used to, I, I was always a single payer person and during the Affordable Care Act, I was on the outside fighting with all the incredible advocates for a single payer system, but when we couldn't get it, we were like, okay, let's, you know, public option is our fallback. And as I've dug into this issue, and, and I'm a bit of a policy person, dug into the details of it, what I've realized is you can't do that and fix the problem. Because if you have two systems, one private system and one public system, the private system will always game the system for more profit. Always. And it will drive up the costs for the public system. So you might be getting your, you know, good coverage affordably if you're on the public system, but the government will still be paying enormous amounts of money, and the private system will still be providing more and more so they'll get the better doctors, they'll get drugs faster, and if you're rich, you'll have probably decent health care, and if you're working class or poor, you won't. So you will have two systems, two-tiered system, and you will not bring down costs. We will pay in the United States of America, if we do nothing for this status quo, we will pay $55 trillion over the next 10 years in healthcare expenditures. 30% of those healthcare expenditures right now, this will go up, are for administrative costs. Medicare charges 4% for administrative costs. It's more if you add in some of the private Medicare Advantage plans that the government contracts with private insurance companies for, it goes up to about 6 or 7% in administrative costs. We pay double what every other peer country pays for health care. And we have the worst outcomes. We, we have the highest mortality rates the, the high, excuse me, the highest maternal mortality rates, the highest infant mortality rates, and the lowest life expectancy. So why defend the status quo? The status quo can't work. I mean, Tom, I know, you know, you talk about this on your show all the time. We have 70 million people who are uninsured or underinsured. And even if you have insurance, you are paying at least $10,000 on average, not at least, on average, out of pocket for other costs that aren't covered. GoFundMe has become the most popular insurance plan. <laughs> and the vast majority of GoFundMe campaigns don't reach their goals. 
Can you imagine that we have to turn to the charity of our friends and people we don't know in order to get a cancer treatment for a kid or a mom or a loved one? It's absolutely outrageous. We deserve better, but it means we have to take the private insurance companies out of the equation and have one government guaranteed insurance plan. Amen. And, and well, the, it, it is probably more down in the weeds than we want to get tonight, but um, in 2005, you know, George W. Bush and the Republicans introduced a privatized form of Medicare, Medicare Part C, which, we, which they refer to as Medicare Advantage, and um, it's, it's an abomination. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's, uh, be very, very, very careful about Medicare Advantage plans because when you get really sick, you will discover, uh, you know, how bad it is. Uh, That's the other thing I just quickly want to say about insurance. You know, some of the people who have insurance and they say they're satisfied with it, we're doing some polling to look at whether they've actually had a, a big medical emergency. Because it's, it's kind of like fire insurance. Right. You love your fire insurance until you have a fire. And then you're like, uh-oh, that wasn't covered and this isn't covered, right? right? So, I mean, I think for some people who have coverage, um, you know, maybe it is decent coverage, but for a lot of people, they've just never had to use it, and right. they don't know what the limits of that coverage are. Right, and there's all kinds of gotchas in the fine print in these Medicare Advantage plans. Um, so I've got um, three things here that are kind of variations on a, on a broad theme, and so I'm just going to jump through them real quickly, and we can both just kind of uh, uh, offer our thoughts on this. Uh, the first is, uh, somebody writes, words matter. Please stop using the term voter suppression. Call it what it is, vote stealing. Thank you for that. Um, yes, the Republicans are stealing your vote, and we need to stop it. And God bless Stacey Abrams, by the way. I have... <laughs> In 2005, in 2000, <laughs> there you go, Bernie Sanders, Stacey Abrams, 2020. <laughs> in 2005, when, when my show was carried by Air America Radio, uh, several of our Air America hosts made a pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. It was me and Randy Rhodes, and I don't recall if Al Franken was there or not. I don't think he was, but um, I think, I'm pretty sure Sam Cedar was there. In any case, there was like four or five of us, and um, we met with a group of, Repub of Democratic senators and a couple of members of the House. Bernie was there. Um, well, I don't want to go through the names because of, of the story I'm going to tell. Um, and this was after the 2004 election, and it was fairly obvious to most of us that, that Kerry had, had won Ohio and should have been the president. And, and, and I got up, and I said to these senators, we were having this dialogue, it was a whole afternoon, said to this, these senators, um, we think it's probably rigged voting machines, we're not really sure, but there's something going on here, that the, the exit polls should not be different than the actual results. They weren't in the 70s, they weren't in the 80s, they weren't in the 90s, and they were in this 2004 election. And why aren't you guys talking about this? Why aren't you doing something about this? And one of these senators got up, and, and she was speaking on behalf of all of the senators. The only person who vigorously disagreed was Bernie. And she said, um, our concern is that if the American people think that their vote won't be counted, or there's some kind of hanky-panky going on in the voting systems, that people will stop showing up to vote. And if people stop showing up to vote, we've got a problem. And this was basically the official position of the Democratic Party right up until the 2018 election, and it was Stacey Abrams. You know, I said, God bless Stacey Abrams. It was Stacey Abrams who had the courage to come out and say, you know, this, this election is being stolen, and I'm not going to put up with this crap anymore. And she never conceded, as she shouldn't have. That's I mean, she, her That's speech correct. was amazing. So... So we can speak to that in just a second. Then another one says, why aren't, aren't Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren the only Democratic candidates to the left of Dwight Eisenhower? So a point that I make on my show frequently. Dwight Eisenhower in 56 actually campaigned for re-election on the fact that he had added 2 million people to Social Security and 3 million people to the union rolls. Um, 
An uh, and another asks the question, would it make sense to ask, are you better off than your grandfather was 60 years ago, you know, playing off the old Reagan, are you better off than you were four years ago? And then somebody has a specific question for you. Uh, do you support Elizabeth Warren's platform, um, even though you've endorsed Bernie? So uh, let me just toss all those to you, and we can riff about it. Then we can bounce this back and forth. I'm trying to There's remember a bunch all of, of them. So, so election security, we passed in the House an election security bill to put a, a significant amount of money, federal investment, into helping states make sure that they're you know, that their voter systems were hack-proof and that um, they did everything they could to encourage voting, expand voting. Um, it's sitting in the Senate graveyard where all good things go to die. Um, and Mitch McConnell has done nothing on that. I really don't think that they care whether this election is legitimate or not. They're not going to do anything about it. Oh, I think it. they rather like it the way it is. They kind of like it the way it is, yeah. But I think that the bigger point that the question was making and your points about Stacey are absolutely right. I mean, we just have not spent time, and this goes to the myth of the likely voter and the truth of every voter that I was talking about earlier. We haven't really cared about everybody voting, honestly, I don't think. We have not tried to get folks of color out to vote. We constantly say to people of color, you're asking for too much, please don't bring up race, please don't talk about, you know, various voter suppression. And, um, and I think that that's a real problem, but I do think it's changing, and I think that this election can be a test of that. What were the other things you asked? Well, about? some of them were just kind of, oh, Elizabeth Warren's platforms, your, thought, your, your thought on, well, thoughts look, on I, that? Well, I, um, look, I am close with Elizabeth Warren, I am closer with Bernie, some of you know, um, I was the first elected official in Washington State to endorse Bernie in 2016, and he, um, and he, his first congressional endorsements, in fact, my first federal endorsement was not from any of the women uh, electeds in Washington State, it was from Bernie Sanders. And um, Bernie endorsed me, Zephyr Teachout, and Lucy Flores. We were his first three congressional endorsements. And I was drawn to him because of not just his, you know, his platforms, Medicare for All, College for All, these were the things I was fighting for. Um, I was out in the streets in 2002, 2003, organizing that huge anti-war uh, protest that we had against the war in Iraq. 50,000 people against the war in Iraq. His foreign policy really matches mine. Um, and there are many things I like about Elizabeth. We've done a lot of things together. The anti-corruption bill I've mentioned a few times. We've written a lot of letters around um, geo and private immigration detention centers, for-profit detention centers, getting them out. Um, we have, uh, we've worked together on a lot of different issues, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a brown immigrant woman. I do not have the ability to look at life through one lens. I have to look at a whole series of things. And Bernie's immigration platform includes many of my bills, including my Dignity for Detained Immigrants uh, Act, which gets rid of private for-profit detention centers. Yeah. It, it, gets, it gets rid of mandatory detention. Um, you know, we have to stop criminalizing immigrants, which started under a Democratic president, actually, in 1996 with Bill Clinton. Um, and Democrats have, have been part of this, not as, you know, we've laid the groundwork in some ways, Democrats and Republicans, for what Donald Trump is doing today. And so I really feel that the candidate that I endorse has to have two things. One, a, a policy platform that hews as closely to what I believe as possible, and, um, and that's Bernie on, on foreign policy, on immigration, on, um, on Medicare for all, obviously, on college for all. But then also, who is going to expand the electorate? I don't think we can win this election unless we expand the electorate. I don't think we can win against Donald Trump unless we get young people out and folks of color out. And I think one of the great things that is wrong today is that a lot of people don't trust government. 
And, you know, I don't think anybody doubts that Bernie believes what he says and that he's going to fight for it because he has been very consistent for the most part on a lot of these things. So, you know, that's why I've endorsed Bernie. But um, I, 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 like you, would be thrilled with either one of them at the end of the day. I will fight for Elizabeth if she is the, the nominee. And frankly, I'll fight for any Democratic candidate against Donald Trump. There you go. So, uh, why, how, what advice do you offer those of us who will be doorbelling for Bernie when people say, but he's a socialist? <laughs> well, look, everybody is going to be tagged with the socialist label. <laughs> um, it, literally, every Democrat is going to be tagged with the socialist label. I don't think that, uh, you know, and I think that there are presidents through the course of history, as you've said, that have been tagged with the socialist label. Anytime somebody tries to do things for working people, um, they are called a socialist. Now, some of these, pro it depends on how you want to define it. Some of these programs are socialist. Um, having a Medicare system, if you believe that the government being the great equalizer of opportunity is socialist, then I guess I'm a socialist too on that. I think the government should be an equalizer of opportunity. It doesn't mean that I want to do everything through the government. I'm not looking to buy my coffee through the government. I don't want to buy my computer through the government. But I do want the government to actually take care of some of these basic things that allow us all to operate off a level playing field. You know, we're going to leave here tonight and we're gonna drive on our socialist roads that are kept safe by our socialist police and back our to our houses that are protected offices. by the socialist fire department. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's like, you know, and, and we're able to do it and read the stop signs because we went to the socialist public schools. Okay. Uh, we feel strongly about this as you can yeah. see. <laughs> So, uh, what will it take for the United States ratification of the core international human rights treaties to the, which the United States is still not a party? We just have to have a president who actually believes that we should be a part of those treaties. Um, that's all it is. This is about political courage on so many of these issues. It's not that we don't know what the right thing is to do. We just have to do it. Yeah. And, and amen. And with that, it's 9 o'clock. I want to thank uh, Representative Jayapal for joining me tonight. Thank, Thank you, you Tom for being Hartman. here. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Drive safely. Thank you. And I'll be coming down to the book table there in the back if you'll let me run through there real quick.